I am joined by Dr Rebecca Allen, who is the co-director of the Swinburne Space Technology and Industry Institute. Rebecca, thank you for joining me. How significant was this moment? Well, as you mentioned, for the first time in humans' history, we have two private citizen astronauts exiting a privately owned and operated spacecraft to venture into the vacuum of space. So it's really phenomenal. They're also testing new suits and they're at an altitude that's much higher um, than where we just saw SUNY and Butch in the International Space Station. And what did it take for this to happen? What would have been involved in the planning? Well, actually, so Jared Isaacman, who helped uh, has helped co-fund this and was part of the inspiration for flight. So back in 2022, off the back of that, they were really motivated to create the Polaris missions and push the Dragon capsules to really understand long-term human space flight. So it was really all about outfitting the capsule to ensure that it was able, the hatch could be opened and it would be safe to depressurize and repressurize. Uh, but the really the thing that took the most time was the development of these extra vehicles vehicular suits, and then all the testing and preparation. So really, it was only a few years, which in terms of preparing space missions is quite short. But even SpaceX, you know, they had a few delays, and they probably could have accomplished this mission even a little bit sooner if it weren't for those delays. How risky was this? Have we ever seen anything even like it at all? Yes, so we've never seen anything like this, um, partly because of the altitude. And so whenever you're operating in space, there's always an inherent risk. Um, but whenever astronauts are exiting a spacecraft, these spacewalks are usually deemed some of the most risky because human lives are involved, but we're also you know, dependent on human performance. Not to mention when they opened the hatch of the capsule, it was traveling at approximately 20,000 kilometers an hour. So you wanna make sure that those astronauts are really firmly secured to the spacecraft. You have to deal with the depressurization of the spacecraft to open that hatch. Um, and then of course, the spacesuits have to operate perfectly. So it was definitely very risky um, in terms of, of these types of, of missions, but we have seen astronauts do it before, just not private astronauts. So it's really spectacular to see that all that training and all that preparation um, paid off. What do you think this means for the future of space travel? Well, look, it's the first time, you know, that we're really seeing, you know, these private companies be able to successfully operate very complex missions using their own technology. So it's huge. Um, and it really shows SpaceX continues to be a positive example of these commercial crew opportunities with the next Polaris missions planned and, of course, their eyes on the red planet. But they're not even the only ones that are operating in the sector. We've also seen Axiom Space demonstrate their capability to support um, you know, human spaceflight. The counterexample, of course, is Boeing, uh, like we just saw with the Starliner spacecraft. So there's really progress that's happening and it's opening up the opportunities, but it's a pace that we still have to be careful because while some are having a lot of success, um, we're also seeing that space really is hard. Uh, you know, it, it continues to be a difficult environment to operate in. Is this something the space community is watching closely? What can the broader space community learn from this? Look, absolutely. I can tell you as someone that has an experiment on the International Space Station right now, there's just not very many opportunities to carry out research in science in microgravity. So in this extreme environment of space with radiation that can help us understand more about long-term human spaceflight and even develop technology that benefits us on Earth. So when we have more commercial opportunities, then we can really accelerate uh, the amount of research that's able to be done and then these innovations and translations. So in particular, just on this flight alone, there were 36 individual experiments, not including the astronauts themselves and also testing the spacecraft, its performance and the effects that the radiation had on it. So there's some material testing there as well. So that's just one flight. So if we can even, you know, multiply this by two or three flights, then it really is going to be tremendous uh, for the amount of research and innovation that can take place. And we talk about them being private citizens, but just to be clear, one of them was a tech billionaire, the other one works for SpaceX. Do you think the day will come when regular citizens can do this kind of thing? 
Well, certainly we're learning a lot more through these flights because, you know, as you mentioned, Sarah and Jared, they're not what we would think of typical astronauts. Of course, they are very fit. But the more I think we get uh, private astronauts who really represent the spectrum of humanity, that will help us uh, understand what is required to be able to have these kind of commercial flights where, you know, citizens like you and I and even, you know, younger uh, school kids who I know would love to go up, that that is more attainable. And of course, you know, the economic model model where you 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 know you have billionaires investing in this technology then ultimately it does make it less expensive for us to create that you know for everyone but i'd say at least for the next decade it's probably out of reach unless you have a spare uh, quarter of a million dollars sitting around it's probably giving people more reason to daydream though isn't it thank you so much yes. for your time it's dr rebecca allen from the swinburne space technology and industry institute